Cloud. Okay, welcome everyone. It is Thursday, August 13th, and uh, this is going to be a highly technical um, deep dive into the uh, file system that uh, uh, Brooke and Daniel have specified on top of IPFS. Um, what I tweeted about, and I will tell you about now, um, is that uh, at one point we thought that the name of it should be Flutes. I don't even remember what it stands for, Brooke. Uh, oh geez, Fission's Fission. local online offline file system, some, something to that effect. Yeah. So, yeah. so we're really bad at, at basically being like, okay, let's make the acronym first and then figure out what it should mean. So flukes, but it really is quite a terrible name. So it's in fact, just um, web native file system or WinFS as you, as you pronounce it. Uh, that is it from me. So I will hand it over to Brooke if you want to turn your, 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 your presentation on. Yeah. Um... And also before I forget, uh, Daniel, just FYI, your little presentation uh, recording is halfway through these slides. So be, be ready. <laughs> uh, share content screen. So this is the first time I've done a broadcast from an iPad directly. So uh, it'll be interesting. Start. All right, everyone can see that? Yep. Can you see slides now? Mm -hmm. yep. Fantastic. All right. So uh, yeah, I'll just dive, dive right in. As, as Boris mentioned, uh, web native file system, um, really just the, the data layer uh, under what we're doing. Uh, when we took a look at everything we need to build, you know, data is by far the first. Um, and we call it a file system. It's also to some degree a graph database, but uh, because they, the two concepts end up getting blended uh, with choice of technology underneath, but uh, this is a web native file system. Um, I always have a little intro slide, which seems a little strange given that this is our stream, but hi, I'm Brooke. I'm the co-founder and CTO at Vision. Um, here's some of my background. Um, mainly been in the distributed web space for a bit, uh, done a bunch of open source. Um, and if you like acronyms, those are some things I'm interested in. <clears throat> so uh, web native, what, what do you mean by this sort of just broadly? Um, we think that web apps in 2020 are too hard. And so we're looking to shrink the development cycle down, right? So, you know, there's a big stack of things you have to do today. And we think that we can get this all into the browser directly. Um, hence web native, do everything natively right in the browser. <clears throat> um, and working from this uh, assumption, right? We have to start thinking about things a little bit differently and new interesting ways of working sort of fall out of it, right? Um, so uh, yeah, sorry. And then obviously because this is a much thinner stack, Right, we're trying to get it, uh, have people have faster iteration, things can work offline as well. Um, you know, your local is production, et cetera. <clears throat> it gets you much closer to your users and lowers the barrier to entry so that more people, you know, you don't have to learn this giant stack, more people can, um, uh, can build useful things on top of this. Um, as I mentioned before, new assumptions means uh, a new approach. So, uh, all of this depends on the, the main fundamental shift is that location is now independent. So we don't have to say the stuff lives on that server over there. We just say the stuff is available, right? So it's no longer a client server architecture. It's all um, peer to peer, even though some peers are more powerful than others. Um, we also need, because everything's in the browser, and this is going to come up a fair bit in this presentation, uh, client side encryption and end to end encryption. Uh, so even when it's stored, you know, we make sure that there's always a live copy available, even when you close your machine, right? Um, we need that to be totally, um, you know, encrypted at rest. We can't see it because if we can see it, everybody else can see it, right? Because now lo location doesn't matter. Um, and we're moving away from this idea of networked machines that have some code on it to networked data where the data itself is, is uh, linked and that is independent of 
some network, right? It's just the, the data has links between it. Um, and because these are going to come up as well, uh, something that Daniel and I found uh, helpful because we're, we end up having to talk at these different layers, right? There's like how we like to think about things in, you know, it's a file system, there's directories, there's, you know, uh, files, there's some metadata, et cetera. But then we actually have to go and, you know, put this on a, um, down at a lower level directly in IPFS, um, though we're not, um, uh, uh, tightly coupled to IPFS. We could actually swap out uh, something else, but uh, IPFS meets our, our needs really nicely right now. And so different parts of this presentation will be talking about like, well, here's how it actually gets put on to the network versus how we work with it in the browser. Uh, and, uh, you know, we have some translation between the two. Uh, the main idea here is that, you know, obviously you have abstractions, the application should never have to worry about, well, but what's the SID of this or the content ID of this piece of data? It should never have to care about that. Um, and just to kind of give you a sense of everything that we that we have and, and sort of where we're going. So in order to enable the what we're talking about today, web native file system, we need some other concepts as well. So you have identity, which is guaranteed with a um, uh, key pair, so public and private keys. Uh, read access, again, uh, you know, uh, AES keys, it's an object capability model instead of uh, access control because it's no longer data that lives inside some process. It's data that a process can act on, right? So it's this sort of flipped model. We've given a presentation in the past about uh, user controlled authorization networks. Um, or, or UCANs, uh, which is a, a, again, a cryptographically secured way of saying what um, portion of the file system a user is allowed to write to, and then they can also delegate those rights to uh, some subset of those rights to, to others. And we're mainly talking today about this durable store, so a native file system. Um, we also have, um, and we'll be talking briefly also about the exchange store today. Um, we are um, working on soft real time uh, as well. Um, and then above this, we have all of our app abstractions and then people can build apps on top of that. So let's dig in. So I, I'm trying as, as much as possible in this presentation to not give, you know, code and algorithms and, and stuff. So it's gonna be basically diagrams. Uh, if there's something that's unclear, please stop me and just ask the question. Okay. And sorry, uh, Brooke, I'll, I'll start, I'll stop at, uh, at mentioning you as I live tweet this. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I actually thought that, huh, weird. I do have do not disturb on, but I'm still getting messages. Weird. <clears throat> okay. Uh, high level layouts. Uh, we want it to look like a regular file system. So we have this public side with photos, apps, you know, and you can have as many uh, subdirectors as you want. Um, taking uh, uh, a cue from how things are done on uh, Mac OS. We have some standard directories as well. So photos, music, uh, et cetera. And we're, we're actually uh, really excited to um, hopefully get people to use these common folders to build up more data and make the data richer around them. But you can also write, you know, uh, unstructured, you know, your own file system as well. Um, and then apps as well have their own store that they can share um, or link into the main um, uh, file system as well. And they just ask for permission for things. On the public side, everything's public, so they don't have to ask for permission for anything. The private side, um, uh, obviously you do. So it, it, um, you need to have a, a key and a pointer uh, into the system, uh, but there's this fully encrypted, end-to-end -end encrypted, encrypted REST. Um, private section. Uh, and then we need to be able to do sharing uh, offline or, or at minimum asynchronously. So things that are shared by me to others uh, into that private file system. So uh, keys and pointers that, that will let somebody read, say, my gallery, but not, um, but not photos, right, or vice versa. And things shared with me so that I don't have to worry that the key is going to disappear. I can just cache it. <clears throat> Um, and I'm going to turn it over for a, uh, to Daniel for a quick demo of what this looks like in practice, and then we'll, we'll actually pull apart how uh, each of those sections work. Uh, 
Uh, are you doing the screencast, Brooke, or am I doing that? You're, you're doing it. Okay, got it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I thought that you were putting it in the presentation. Yeah, so uh, un unfortunately, because Daniel's on Ubuntu, his screen uh, cast is in, uh, uh, what was it? WebM, yeah. uh, which my iPad doesn't know how to read. <laughs> so. I think WebM made it into Firefox recently, but uh, Mac OS mainly is just all like. Everyone can see this? Yep. OK, great. This also lets me pause it if I didn't get the timing right. All right, so this is a screencast that I did of um, a couple of the apps that we have published. Um, and these apps are mainly put together by um, Steven on our team. So all praise to him for how beautiful they are. Uh, so this is the landing page for Drive, which is your UI for interacting with, um, uh, with the web native file system. We're gonna sign in and the first thing that you'll notice is that it redirects us to auth.fission.codes, uh, which is the authorization lobby. Um, and if you look at the query parameters, one of them is a DID, which is short for decentralized identifier, and that's a link back to the key pairs uh, on the page that redirected you here. Um, so yeah, we'll create a, create a new account and link it to Drive, um, just an email and a username. And you'll note that you don't even have to worry about passwords because that's all taken care of with our um, key infrastructure. Now it's gonna uh, prompt you for permissions. In this case, it's saying, should uh, we allow Drive, which right now is just at localhost, um, access to some set of your file system for some amount of time. Uh, in this case, your entire file system. And then it'll bring you back here uh, to Drive. And um, this should look pretty familiar. It's what you might expect from a file system. Uh, I also, I'm doing this on localhost right now um, so that I can add some console logs uh, in the SDK so that you can see which functions are actually being called uh, as we interact with the web page. Um, so the first thing that we do is we bootstrap your drive with some of those uh, folders that you might expect by just doing make dir. Um, and then we'll come in and we'll um, do a few different things. Maybe we want to create a directory. Uh, we'll create a directory called cool pictures and you can see what's going on over here. Um, we make that, oh, I was hoping to pause that. Yeah. Uh, we make that directory uh, and then we do a LS um, of that directory and see that there's nothing in there. Um, and we'll add a couple photos to it and Brooke will respond to the fact that Ubuntu's default screencast time is 30 seconds and it cuts you off after that. Um, yeah, we'll add a couple of photos and again, you can see what's going on over here. It's just giving a path to where you want that photo and then you send any sort of content that you want. It could be JSON. In this case, it's a blob, which is essentially a browser version of a stream. Um, you can preview that content in the web page uh, with a cat and then you might want to remove that content, uh, which is just an RM. Uh, so those are those are pretty basic file system uh, POSIX style file system commands, um, and uh, yeah, they just operate directly on the file system in the browser. So now we'll hop over to a second app. Uh, this is a quotes app that Stephen recently published. It's a way of keeping track of and sharing some of your favorite quotes. Uh, and we wanted to show this off because uh, you know, Drive is a file system style app, so it makes sense that it maps pretty closely to the file system. Um, so we wanted to show what it would look like for a, um, for a more typical app to interact with the file system. Um, so yeah, once again, we'll sign in with Fission. Um, this time it takes you directly to permissions because you're already signed in and it's already holding your keys in the browser. Um, and then we'll add a quote. Um, put in a little pro cryptography propaganda, um, give it an attribution. And again, uh, we'll pop open the console so that you can um, see what's going on underneath the hood here. Um, yeah, so as you can see, this is just a LS of this folder and then adding simple JSON content um, to it to represent quotes. And what you'll notice about these paths is that they're in an apps folder uh, and then a I think I did a refresh. And then a uh, slug right there of the username of whoever's app it is with the app name. 
uh, and then however they want to um, however they want to store that data. So Stephen's storing it in a collections folder and then uh, indexed by the ID of the quote. Um, and then we'll hop over here to the code. This is the code for the quotes app um, so that you can see how simple it is to call into the file system. Just um, pause for a second, Daniel. There's a, there's a couple of questions. Oh yeah, totally. Uh, uh, so Sorry, first I'm one from thinking. Aaron is I, I, what does I RM? Think, I, I think Daniel's like 10 seconds from the end of this and then okay. we can do questions, yeah. Uh, yeah, so this, this is the tail end of it. Um, yeah, so you can see how simple this is to call into the file system. Uh, this is the function for adding a quote. Um, uh, this is a simple helper function that helps you format that path. Uh, removing a quote is very similar with an RM. Uh, and then loading quotes, you do an LS of uh, where that collection sits and then catting each one of those quotes. Uh, and right now, this uh, we have this at path helper for creating those paths that you saw in the console, um, and that's a, a very narrow layer over the top of the file system. It's a way of structuring um, your app data. Uh, a feature that we're going to be rolling out down the line is a larger abstraction over the file system so that you can interact with it uh, as if it's a collection of apps. Um, you can also dive into the file system itself if you want to get into the nitty gritty, but then you also have that nicer abstraction on top of for interacting with apps. Um, sweet. So yeah, that's the end of the um, screencast and we can do questions now. Awesome. So from, um, uh, and I'll just read them out in chat. Um, so from Aaron, uh, what does RM do under the hood? So since it's all stored in IPFS, stuff doesn't really get deleted. So what's RM doing? Right. So RM is basically disconnecting it from uh, your file system. It's removing any pointers um, to that object. Uh, if you want to do a, uh, you know, like very hard delete on the private side, you, uh, you might do a key rotation along with it. But uh, in RM right now, just disconnects it from your file system and makes it difficult to find. There's not going to be any pointers to it. And so no one will um, locate it. And this is a little bit how how regular file systems work too, isn't it? Yeah, and it means like you you, you update sort of some kind of list, and it doesn't include that element anymore, like that pointer. Right. Yeah. Right. So yeah. it means you've made in this case you probably make a new version of the list or a new partial version of the list that doesn't include that pointer. And if you happen to have had that pointer, you could recover the data, and then you could do key rotation to more properly do it. Yeah, so uh, the way it works today is by dropping that link in the parent uh, and then presumably it'll get garbage collected um, by IPFS uh, unless somebody else has a, has a reference to it. Um, the next stage after this, which I'm going to be talking about uh, briefly or shortly here uh, in slides is uh, the file system will also be uh, non-destructive by default. Um, so we'll be pushing a next version with a link back, yeah. right? So you, in fact, we're, we're saying you can't delete stuff, or if you want to delete it, like actually get rid of this file. That's a pretty intense thing to do. You have to make sure that you actually want it gone. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. So, so what we're taking as guidance, obviously, is if you look at iCloud Drive or Dropbox, uh, or your desktop operating system, this is how they work. Um, and we're very lucky to be able to lean on a bunch of those paths. Um, you know, even things like some of the like sign in with Fission, um, if you look at it, we'll, we'll feel a little bit how signing into I iCloud on a new machine feels like. Um, yeah. So next question from Austin. So if Fission uses keys stored in the browser, what about compromised machines is two factor on the roadmap? So, very briefly, so we're using the, the, so keys in the browser to a lot of people sounds super scary. So for starters, that's the web crypto API that's built into all browsers um, as of current versions. So we get wide coverage, including on, on, on mobile. This is not us rolling our own solution here. Get that on record. Um, and then uh, compromised machines. So, you know, this is a huge issue various forms of, of, of two-factor. We've got this distributed system where we encourage people to uh, link multiple devices. 
and those keys on other systems um, represent your account um, as well. And so um, there's a bunch of things that we can do there. So the way iCloud works today, if you, if you log into a new machine that hasn't been seen before, um, you'll actually get this little pop-up on your phone and your other devices that you're logged into saying, is, is this you? Um, and the reverse of, of revoking um, will have to work similarly to, to something like this. Um, um, so two-factor yes, exactly how that's implemented, um, you know, TBD, and obviously we can layer things on top of it. Not working today, but web auth n um, is another thing built into browsers where you can even use secure keys. Um, this doesn't totally work with web crypto to today, unfortunately, but it's stuff that we'd like to look at. Carson, go ahead. Can I yeah, just respond to that real quick? Yeah. Okay. Uh, it just sounds like on that. Um, you've mentioned key rotation a couple times. So if, if it's like uh, identity via sort of consensus, then, you know, to answer my question, compromise machine, I would just hop on a different machine and key rotate. Does that sound? Okay. Um, so we don't really have a concept of identity per se. Uh, we just have, there's the root identity and then uh, others can have, there's read and write access. Read access is a AES key. And if you want to revoke read access, you can go through and re-encrypt stuff, right? Um, it's actually much faster process than it sounds. Uh, and we also think that uh, if you don't have a pointer, so most people will have a pointer to something higher up in the tree than what they're looking for. If you encrypt just the spine, it's gonna be really difficult to find that thing. And if they did have a pointer to it, like let's say that they're like, oh, I'm, I wanna keep this around, I'm gonna put a hard link to this and then it's gonna stay in my system. That's the same as downloading a file. They're, they're functionally equivalent. So it's, it's the same. Uh, for write access, um, we issue credentials that are the same or lower. So scoped smaller than whoever gave you the credential. So that starts from the root and uh, works down. Um, and we can revoke those by their SID. And the root being the root of the file system on whatever device has been the, right? Whoever created it originally. So created every device what? has its own key pair, totally separate key pair, that are kept in the browser or, or on disk. Uh, the ones in the browser are non-exportable, so you can't actually get the private key out ever, right? And then you say, okay, so machine A wants to give machine B access. We're going to write a credential for their public key. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Yeah. So, so yeah, some, something we bumped into a bunch with keys in the browser is that like these days, effectively browser storage you, is, it's basically ephemeral. Like you have to treat it like mm -hmm. it's not going to be there tomorrow. So how do you deal with that when it comes to like key you basically yeah how do you deal with that with the fact that like if i don't check my fission app for a couple of realistically you know it's hard to know for sure how they've implemented it but seven days yeah exactly uh so how do you deal with that like i haven't checked my thing in a while and i lost my phone in a mud puddle and blah 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 am i how do you deal with that? Yeah. Maybe the yeah, answer so we don't, so, so we don't have anything implemented today, but we have a, a proof of concept from actually 12 months ago um, that, uh, that Daniel did as I think it was like the first thing we had you do with us. Um, so we, we have a couple options. One, you can go to another device and set, set, set the account up and relink, right? The, uh, inconvenient, but you can do it. Uh, the other is a email-based recovery using um, a zero wallet. So uh, you base uh, essentially you have two pieces of data. Um, one might be a password. One will be like a recovery seed. You put those together, or sorry, you take one of them, you hash them, send them to the server, or we do key stretching. So we add a bunch of extra data hash that, send it back, and then you can combine that with your recovery key to have a, uh, a recovery private key. So, and, okay, and have we'll, we we'll bounce back and forth between different layers where I'm this much higher level layer. So what you're describing is logging in, right? So um, because 
all of the um, files have permanent and immutable addresses, yep, they're going to um, essentially fall out of cache of various browsers lots of the time. Um, for keys and with web crypto and then with the fission login, we've made it very, very easy to do all of these things and put them all into the SDK. Oh, I'm logged out. I need to log back in. Making that really convenient and easy is the challenge that we have where ideally, you know, if you're at a desktop, um, you have a GitHub key and from our research um, and, you know, talking and interviewing developers, they pretty much set it up when they get a new machine. And then they like go and look at the instructions of how to get a new GitHub key when they get a new machine. Um, and so obviously that happens lots more in the browser because it actually gets garbage collected. Um, but ideally we, we have this pattern, which is similar to how Keybase works, where they really work on onboarding where you're like, hey, make sure you have multiple accounts linked. And then also have, Brooke described this like zero knowledge uh, or email address, right? For end users, guess what? This will end up looking a lot like um, an email magic link, right? That's the, the all of these things yeah. we just want to hand to developers of being the best practices, most secure and easy to use login system. Um, so from a user perspective, if you are logged out, um, you will, and I'm doing air quotes because I did a long uh, write up of this um, on, the, on the forum. Um, you'll basically do a login, however you're doing that with linking from another device uh, or an email, um, and then your keys are there. Your file system won't be there, so it'll need to fetch the bits that you need, obviously, to, to cache it again. Um, but we think that's a pretty good start. And if we go in other directions, like having a native mobile app, then we can do other things, but we're not focusing on that native mobile solution. We think that this will work really well for mobile developers where they can use this instead of iCloud Sync, um, which is again, more like a desktop operating system where the key is right in the device. Um, but it should be as good or better than any SaaS experiences that you have today. Does that make sense? I mean, the other thing you can, yeah, that, I think that's the only, only right answer right now. Um, the other thing you can do is, like you mentioned, is take advantage of some of the like key management that all browsers are supporting and all operating systems are supporting now. And just be honest and say, look, we'll stick this in your iCloud keychain because you are mm -hmm. you have it. Like, <laughs> it's it's probably taking advantage of the um, uh, what you call it. Your uh, enclave. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so might as well use that. And I think that's. Yeah, we then would. It backs it up on iCloud probably, which we're trying to avoid. But uh, you know, a couple of keys in there isn't the end of the world. Yeah, and also we would really app. love the WebAuthn standards to be more powerful rather than just sign in a very Arbitrary. particular way. Yeah. 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 Um, you can do a lot with just signing things, though. You can, but we we. So, and w which was our initial assumption. And then we looked at it and we we're like, oh no, like it'll only sign like these couple of things in this specific way. Yeah, it's a very so you can't actually, format. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, if anyone would like to uh, cry over key formats. Uh... <laughs> this is the call. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, Austin, I do want to cover this. Uh, I know that you've done some work in, in health healthcare. So ideally, we haven't done the like legal review parts, but ideally from a GDP and a HIPAA perspective, directionally, the fission solution would be like, we don't keep it. We don't access it. We can never look at it. Even if we're a service provider, developers can't look at any of your stuff either unless you give them permission. It's end-to-end -end encrypted and it's encrypted at rest. Um, so we should be able to meet a lot of those um, GDP requirements. Uh, it's not a like a totally specific design goal because we haven't gotten there yet. We're at the get it working mode, but um, lots of people have asked and directionally we'd, we'd like to get there. Does that make sense? I think I was just referencing the RM command specifically. It's just like, if a thing gets deleted, it's like, it's more just dereferenced, but because it's an yeah. immutable store, it's not actually like removed. So if somebody did have, like you said, in read mode, a hard link to um, some content that you as a user no longer want, say, some hierarchical organization to own, right? Like, 
what is yeah. what are the sort of consequences of, of it, and it's gonna be one of those things where we have really fun discussions with <laughs> lawyers who don't know technology of being like well in fact this address will exist forever even if all copies of the file itself on the planet no longer exist so what do you mean by file exactly mr lawyer <laughs> oh my gosh not, i would love to sit on one of those conversations carson <laughs> <laughs> I mean, just to, to respond to what do i mean by file right. um, <laughs> No, but it's it's actually it's it's not an it's not really that different, right? Because like even now, I can't go, like you know to to satisfy a bunch of the GDPR rules. Like I can't go into your computer and force you to delete something. All I can do is say, please delete this thing, and like mm -hmm. the file system can, system can do that. Like if someone makes a formal request for removal of their data, you could say, great, these are all of the hashes that have ever been you know that we know of that were ever associated with your account any provider that you had linked to your account, these are the hashes that must be deleted. And then that's as like good as you can do. And I always think of this, actually um, my colleague Andrew has a great analogy, which is basically like, it's all like, it's all email. It's all like email. The, if I accidentally send an email to you and I'm like, oh shit, I did not mean to send that to so-and-so. I can send an email saying, please delete that email I just sent you. And also please don't read it. But like, <laughs> It's gone, right? So like, I gotta hope that you're gonna do that. And that's like legally as good as I can do. Um, and so I think that- I love the email like, analogy. That's a super interesting one. Uh, lawyers will be able to understand that one. So I'm now gonna refer to it as, they're not files, they're email. Um, yeah. I mean, honestly, yeah, I, I think I like it's, a great, it's a, a great lot. analogy, yeah. right? Which is like, the thing is gone. You, there's nothing you can do about it. And even if you have that thing where it's like, you can undo an email send, that's just delaying sending it, right? Like it's yeah. still- gone when it's gone so uh I like the that. other question uh Gary, how is pinning getting done so for those of you who know the finer details of um ipfs um there's various concepts in there that we're essentially ignoring um so uh we're not exposing to the user or to the developer um you know developers could have some control over this if they want um, so i'll answer this in two ways one so our general approach to this is everything that's not a giant file, AKA a video, should just be pinned and available, whether you're online or offline. Uh, part of being on the Fission platform is that we'll just take care of it and we'll keep it, we'll keep it online um, in your encrypted version and everything else like that. Um, the uh, second part of this is because we're dealing with this distributed file system, um, one of the feature requests, I guess I should probably write this up, is I would in fact like um, users to be able to um, essentially kind of link their own hosted files um, into Drive is probably the, the interface. Um, and um, um, so that might look like the specific example is that Steven, uh, again, the author of a lot of the front end of a bunch of this stuff also has a distributed music player called Diffuse. Um, and I have the same scenario. I've got 80 gigs of music on my machine. I don't need Fission to back it up for me and I don't necessarily need to pay for that kind of backup of that. But if I'm sitting on my local machine or other, or I have it sitting at home and, and available online, I can link in this like local music folder, which has a unique address that's in the global IPFS space. Um, and it won't be accessible if I'm on my phone necessarily. Um, um, and this is a little bit like things like Nextcloud, right? You can, you can have a server that you can host in your home or a Raspberry Pi. We'd love to do more with Raspberry Pi um, where people can bring their own storage. Realistically, again, this is like iCloud and like Apple where they're like, here's five gigs for free, free. Um, and th that'll get you going. And that's a similar pattern. Uh, as a developer, you can rely on all of your Fission account users having some amount of storage that they can just get up and running immediately um, in various ways for them to access more. Uh, and just to cover this off, so Carson, yes, um, something like Filecoin, which would be a long-term archive uh, or backup, depending on what you want with this. You know, Fission really focuses on liveness um, um, and both hosting and liveness of files, whereas Filecoin is, promises to be a long-term archive backup kind of solution. Um, and would it be a great fit to like plug in as an app 
for Fission. So either your personal desktop files that you don't need Fission to store at all, or your web native file system could be could be archived with with Filecoin. Yeah, I mean Filecoin is particularly unsuited, at least right now, in mainnet launch for like small, fast data. Yep. Um, <clears throat> But for like yeah, cold storage, once you have like a large enough archive that you could seal a whole sector, then it's worth thinking about it. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Uh, Gary, did you want to follow on from your question about pinning? Yes, the, the, I, th I think the, the real magic is if you run anything like RPSF desktop or just run uh, IPFS in your browser or it's built into, to built into Brave, then you can indeed I, I hosting big videos like that, and it beats uh, beats pin art or anything because I never need to upload 300 megabytes. Anybody wanting to look at look at that video, they will find it. So I mean that, that that's just unbeatable. So and so there are other um, yeah the other fallouts and uh, this was supposed to be super technical. So I'm going to pass it back to to Brooke to get back to her presentation. But um, in short. Um, Basically, we use IPFS natively everywhere. This has caused us some problems. Other systems favor their HTTP interface for uploading and downloading in some cases. And we mostly focus on native, native IPFS usage so that we can get a global CDN for, for free. We can cache in users' browsers. Um, so it's, it, it has caused us some pains, but we're taking the pain on. So ideally, it's much more usable for, for, for everyone. Um, obviously, Carson and his textile team have been doing lots in improving JS IPFS and, and all this stuff so that we can uh, we can make this work. So that was our choice of like, okay, we're going to stand on top of this and and really lean into the capabilities of it. There's just one more sentence, and I really like the idea that this live data, you know, that that is not actually big in 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 quantity, but is really guarantees that that if all my machines turned off. The, the app is still working. I mean, that, that, that's amazing, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Uh, so Caleb uh, had one more question or, or comment. So in Android photos, after you delete, you have like 30 days to recover it, then it's gone forever. Um, and what if it's just like a flag on authorization authentication that sets the access level to no one? Um, yeah, I mean, we need some sort of trash version of this and there's some complexity even in what Carson described of, of like, oh, we won't store these hashes. Well, if they're, you know, um, a, a PDF that's public that other people also have, um, you know, your encrypted version is going to be a different version, but like we're storing it on behalf of other people. So there's this other layer of a little bit of strangeness, but soft delete and a trash like system is how Brooke and Daniel have designed it. Back to you, Brooke. All right. Weatherman uh, mode. Yes. Yeah, back here. Okay. So, demo done. Everyone can see the slides again? Yes. Excellent. Cool. So, common concepts. Um, so uh, much like how a Unix file system works, you know, you, you have the actual like raw data on disk that li lives at a particular location, and you know, you um, it's just like a, a sequence of bytes, and you don't really have much information about that. That's in a lot of ways how we're looking at um, regular raw, you know, IPFS protocol IPLD. We still support it; it's a, a raw node. Um, but we can't do a ton with it beyond linking data, creating trees. Um, building up from that, we can put a bunch of these nodes together and then draw an abstraction boundary around it and say, well, this is a, this is a file node. It has the raw data. We also have some metadata. So all the typical um, POSIX stuff, you know, uh, time it was modified, you know, et cetera, but also things like tags and what the original source of it was. And, you know, you can kind of see that being, you know, unboundedly growing uh, metadata about a file. Uh, and then obviously directories, which are, uh, contain other directories and other files. They have the, um, essentially the same layout, 
the index is a pointer to multiple different, again, virtual nodes, which might be any of these three, um, as opposed to in a file node, it's raw data only. So um, similar layout, we can stick an abstraction, well, we've stuck an abstraction around it, um, but these are the three base building blocks that we have. Um, we really quickly ran into the, the exact same thing that uh, Creators of Unix did, which is that we need hard and soft links. Uh, so hard links being, uh, you know, what we think of as a normal sort of, you know, IPFS link, it um, is a direct pointer to something, it'll keep that in the tree, um, because, you know, the whole, the whole structure goes up to a root, or keep it in the DAG rather. Uh, but if you have two pointers to the same data with hard links, uh, you won't get any updates, right? If you update one path, you're not updating the other path unless you, you walk the entire tree to look for other pointers to that same file. Uh, so as soon as you have a second pointer, this is a copy, it's a duplicate. Um, soft links uh, are more like web links or sim links, right? Uh, any pointer to, everything has a canonical path in hard links, and then you have a symlink, uh, it'll always see the latest version of that file. It's, it's not a copy, it's just a reference. The downside of this is it might break. You might have a dangling uh, soft link. Um, so, you know, there, there are some, some trade-offs, but you'll always have some version available because at some stage we checked, in fact, there is a file here. So you'll always be able to go back to the latest version of that file, even if it's not in the current file system. Uh, the other exciting thing about that is now it becomes very easy to link between file systems without having to copy all of the data. You can just reference something, you know, Boris can reference something in my file system without having to actually make a copy of it into, uh, into his storage or to reference it and say, Brooke's updating this, this document, but I want to follow along with where it's at. You can also think of this as there's almost like a virtual root above these two trees that um, that they both point at. That's always being updated. Uh, it'd be impractical to actually update this because we would need everybody using IPFS to, to point at it, but, um, but conceptually you can, can think of it that way as it's all one giant global tree of stuff. Uh, versioning I mentioned a little bit in the, um, uh, in the, the Q and A break. Uh, so, because everything is uh, in nice acyclic graphs, we can start making use of persistent features, uh, specifically functional persistence. So, uh, every time you write into the file system, uh, this isn't implemented today, but it's, it's actually pretty small to do, so we're going to do it uh, uh, quite soon. Every time you write in and you make a change, we're not going to drop the old links. Right, so this bottom thing here is time. This is the first revision or, you know, generation zero. And all we do is instead of deleting um, uh, avatars at R0 and adding, you know, this one with headshots on it, we can just link up this new structure and leave the old one and then even have pointers to the old, um, the old spine that's been updated and even include the event that happened, so we now have an evented file system where you can consume as an application, these are the things that have changed. And you can do kind of whatever you want with that. And it doesn't have to be the file system that the, that application is running in. Uh, it could be somebody else watching your file system, for example. <clears throat> um, the other way to think of this is with generations. So this bottom picture is revisions. Uh, where we have these, you know, little little pieces, but uh, the whole aggregate of that with the shared components, uh, you can think of it as generations moving, where some portion of it stays the same. This picture is pretty linear, you know, left to right, um, but structurally it's the same as this. So if you prefer seeing it as a tree rooted at the top um, and working down, this is the, the same nodes just rearranged, uh, so we never actually change or delete anything. We just accrete new layers on the outside of it. This also has some nice properties where you can say, okay, well, take me back to last week 
And now in the context of last week, let's ask questions about the file system, right? Um, we can say, you know, doing this kind of thing in even a database, unless it's an invented database or, you know, a, a time series database is really difficult to do. You can say in, in the context of this, what were the sales figures for my company, right? Or whatever it was, uh, how much have things grown between, between these, these two contexts, right? Um, and so you get a lot of power with just a small number of uh, extra links and each of the, these directory nodes are actually quite lightweight. So we don't even really incur a storage penalty or too much of one at least. Uh, private nodes are, are fairly simple. Uh, each encrypted node is just a uh, random binary blob. You combine that with the correct AES key and you get back out a virtual node that looks, it's encoded differently, but the, um, the information it contains is the same as what's in the public side plus the keys for all of its children, if it's a, um, if it's a directory. Uh, which means now that if you have the key to some node, it doesn't even have to be the root of the system, just any sub, sub portion, uh, you also have read access to everything below, which is the same interaction model that you see in say Google Drive or um, Dropbox. Can, can I ask an interrupting question? I'm yeah. yeah. Interrupt it. So <laughs> just, I just wanted to like, uh, point this out or like make you aware of it. Um, mm -hmm. Myself and a bunch of other uh, folks have started working with protocol labs and we actually have some funding to do this to mm -hmm. implement a standard DAG as part of the full IPLD DAG spec for storing yeah. um, essentially like uh, Jose and Cose like style um, encrypted data and signed data. Mm -hmm. And you may be interested in that just because that would make, like if the standard is adopted, that would make uh, um, fission style DAGs like compatible across different applications and different teams building similar apps. Um, yeah. But also it would be very valuable to have your feedback there. So if you want, I can give you some links and stuff to the initial, and there's a recording of a call that we just had as well. Okay, yeah, uh, definitely send over the link to the recording. Uh, the three box folks uh, pinged us with uh, a link to the spec uh, a couple times. Uh, oh, we were okay, so cool. deep into this already that it didn't really make sense for us to change anything, but it may, may be down the line, yeah. We're kind of in the same boat, uh, textile, but um, uh, yeah, we have this funding with Protocol Labs to do this, so um, we're at least going to spec it out and then see how hard it is to... I don't think it, like, I think it's pretty compatible, so... Um, mm -hmm. We'll see, but yeah, I'll send yeah. you the links. Or well, if you already have that, I'll send you the link to the video then. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Um, and are are you guys also doing crypt trees um, as well? Uh, well, we're going to start with just like the the Kose, um like spec for encrypted like the encrypted blobs or encrypted data. Mm -hmm. So you can, but you could have like a tree of those. So in that sense, yes, but the spec is not by, by like very deliberately not going to encode anything about the key management or key storage like you have here. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. um, because, well, for two reasons, one, because, uh, it has to be pretty general, but, and two, because, um, the Jose Cose specs don't include that. So, right. um, so that's that is a like consideration. But what you could you could still implement nested key storage on, like with the same spec, and you can do like wrapped keys and all that stuff as part of the yeah. Jose Cose spec. Anyway, I don't want to derail the conversation too much because it's like hyper technical, yeah. but yeah, maybe of interest. Yeah, 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 absolutely. And I mean, we, you know, uh, I think really the whole team, but you know, especially Boris and I have come out of doing lots and lots of spec work and uh, you know, definitely see the, the value in everybody uh, interoperating. It's just sort of like trying to ship while watching the ever 
ever shifting sands of well, what's actually adopted and specified. So, which yep. I, uh, yep, <laughs> yeah. So. I can sympathize with that. Yeah, no uh, problem. And, yeah. and to be clear, spec work because it has more than one meaning. Specification work, standards and spec specs. Yes. Yeah. 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 Not working on spec. <laughs> Although that's also sometimes important. Yes, anyway. we, we've, we've done that too. <laughs> yeah. Yay, open source. Yeah. Um, awesome. Okay. So uh, continuing on. Uh, yeah. So, um, right. So you have this uh, encrypted node. Um, when you add the key, obviously it becomes decrypted. The other nodes in here aren't linked directly because it's, it's encrypted, right? So the, the actual uh, other encrypted linked pieces are pre-floating, we'll, we'll talk about in a moment, elsewhere. And then we have links to their, uh, the SID of the encrypted chunk, right? Um, as well as the key for each link. Um, looks roughly like this, right? So you have a human readable name, the revision number for the um, for versioning, and then a key. Um, I guess as well as a, a pointer to the actual thing. Um, and because it's uh, a crypt tree, so each we can take some subset of this. So in this case, these three lower um, lower nodes, uh, and give somebody just the key to that. You don't have to have the whole file system, you can give some, you know, some subtree or su subgraph. Um, the actual, so dropping down a layer, how it's actually stored, uh, we're using a modified Merkle Patricia tree. So, which is really to say uh, a, um, a, a kind of binary search tree. Uh, well, actually it's not binary, we're using a, a weight of 16. Um, which interestingly, so uh, Daniel and I went back and forth on a bunch of different weights, um, and we landed on exactly where Ethereum's MMPT is. So uh, interesting that that seems to be the the sweet spot. So every node has 16 links under it, and then you know recursively down. Um, and this store is append only, right? So you can never actually drop anything from it, which is really nice because you're again you're only accreting data. Um, the number of things you can hold in a tree of, of this layout, um, obviously it's exponential, but at four layers, we can have 65,000 items. At five layers, layers, I believe it goes into the millions. Um, so lookups are actually quite quick. Um, it's a panda only. We're getting better read-write performance out of this than we had with a flat array. It's Merkleized and it's concurrency friendly because it's a panda only. Um, and the other nice thing it does is it obfuscates where the, the relationship between the nodes from the materialized tree when they're decrypted. So there's no similarity in structure whatsoever between what the user sees when it's decrypted and how it's stored. So we're adding some extra level of obfuscation. So, and to be clear on this, um, you know, we haven't had a lot of reviews or, or other things like that that we'll, that we'll need to, to do, but um, obviously Brooke and Daniel both have a, have a lot of experience with both um, uh, other more blockchain systems um, and, and a design goal has been uh, protecting user metadata so that we don't like leak some of these things. Um, uh, we'll, we'll need to get other people to dig in and look at this, but this has been all in favor of uh, shipping a 1.0 that we can then argue about both the spec and the implementation and have it working in practice. Yeah, and, absolutely. And frankly, more secure than the model of we're going to keep your SaaS data in a database that anyone in the company can look up in the database. Yeah. yeah um, even working on HIPAA, like this is blatantly clearly better than anything I've worked on before. Like, yeah. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I actually feel pretty good about all of this stuff from just a uh, both theory and practice point of view. Um, 
the things that I would like us to get to eventually, but just don't make sense right now, slash I'm not sure if people will actually care, is you will be able to see in here if, um, you know, for example, large file versus small file, right? Um, or if you're tracking um, changes, you know, watching somebody's changes in roots, you may be able to correlate some data. But that's a pretty high bar for then, well, I know that these are the files that were added and like maybe you'll run some analyses to check that like maybe possibly these files are related, but maybe they're not because maybe they sync the files separately, you know, uh, there's a bunch of changes in here instead of just one, right? Like it's, uh, I'm pretty happy with how this portion is from a security point of view. It's not perfect, but it's pretty good. Because this? Because, because what? I've got my math icon up. Oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> because math. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, interesting. Well, I guess not that interestingly. When I screen share here, I, uh, I have no videos of anyone. Oh, so, okay. which is definitely a, a, a downside on this versus uh, using my Mac, but oh well. Um, okay. Name filters. So, uh, having addresses in that MMPT, uh, we need them to be deterministic versioned, addressable, obviously, we need in that write credential to be able to prove that this is some subpath of what they're allowed to write to with minimal knowledge. So it needs to, you basically need to be able to say, here's a random name, but they're allowed to write to it or these other things as well from a single, single path. The key insight here is that AES keys, each, because it's a crypt tree, every node has its own key. That's equivalent to a path segment, or actually it's really only at the, each link has a, has a key, right? So this is path segments, but secret. If you have the AES key, by construction, you already have access to the file. Um, so what we do is we take all of the parent keys, and stick them in a bloom filter. We shaw them first to ensure that people don't, uh, the bloom implementation that we have uses a non-cryptographic hash. So we shaw first, then take the bloom, um, and we can pass this, this uh, bloom of all the key, current keys and parent keys down uh, along the chain. So inside the node, it knows the, the what we're calling a bear filter of its path. We then take that and saturate it by, um, sorry, uh, the other part is, so the AS key and the revision of the current, um, uh, the current version. Uh, so that we're able to then, and we'll talk about seeking ahead uh, in a moment. We then take the, this filter and deterministically saturate it. So we take the filter, shot it, put it in the bloom and do that repeatedly until we have some threshold of bits flipped. Uh, so in our current implementation, the uh, the filter is 1024 bits uh, wide, and we flip uh, I think 320 of those, and it gives us a false positive rate of one in uh, 1.4 billion, I think something something yeah, to that right. effect. Yeah, um, and then we hash that, and that's the name of the um, uh, of the pointer in the MMPT. Um, this means now you're able to say, if you know the, um, uh, the name filter for where you're currently at, prior to the revision, you're now able to arbitrarily say, well, I want revision 50 or 100 or 10,000 and just jump to that one um, in a way that exposes no information about what it is to the outside world or to the verifier. So when one of a uh, new tree hits uh, our server, we need to look at their credential and say, oh, okay, so they're allowed to write to this because they're gonna give us their bare filter. So this first, this top section, which is sparser than, um, than the saturated one. And then we look at the leaves and we're like, oh, okay. So these are all have names that are, um, that contain the bare filter. So they're allowed to write to this with the false positive rate of one in uh, 1.4 billion. Uh, so 
making this interact with versioning is interesting. Um, so UCANs, again, given I talked about it before, but it's, it's essentially a, almost like an X509 certificate, you know, sort of plus plus. Um, uh, they're signing a JWT with um, a key that it claims to have, right? So, and then we, we chain these together so you can get this path back to the original uh, um, uh, issuer. <clears throat> so we have the original revision or, you know, generation zero. And then uh, you want to update this bottom right uh, node. And you only have right access to this one level above. So you do as much rooting progress as you can, right? So you, you work up as much of the, the tree as you possibly can, and you put a pointer to it, and you stick this, this just this little chunk in the MMPT. But it's not attached to the top, right? So, um, but it is, it is in this other structure. So as we walk down, we're gonna to need to do some seek ahead to find it, but the, we will always be making progress because, uh, well, actually this is the next slide. So, you know, there's a couple other rights and then somebody comes along who has right access higher up in the tree. You find the latest revision, which we'll talk about in a moment, and then you attach it as high up as you possibly can, right? Um, so we're always making progress towards the root and shrinking this, the search distance to the latest version. Um, it's, there is some overhead because now we always have to check, is there a version beyond where I currently am if I care about the latest one? Um, so it's, instead of doing one lookup, you're always doing two. Um, oh, sorry, yeah, and then these all link up and the history. And now the new root is this light blue uh, in the top right. Um, uh, we're always making progress towards this. And even if there's some you know, very deep tree, uh, if you have some uh, subtree that's always getting updated and making progress towards it, as soon as you find the root of that one, you can ignore all of the previous history um, uh, that was being made on that subgraph, right? So we're, we make very quick progress uh, in practice. The search algorithm for this, we're not just going to, you know, look ahead as a linked list. Most commonly things will be um, one or two uh, ahead of where you currently are because you looked at it recently or you haven't looked in a really long time. So it's, it's quite far away. Um, so we take the current revision, the, the revision of that link, plus two to the n where n is the round of search you're doing. So we'll start with the next element. If that's not there, you know that you're on the, the current one. You know, and then two, four, eight, 16, et cetera, all the way up. So we do these hops and they get wider until we have a cache miss. And then we do binary search with the same in reverse until we find something that succeeds. So this is roughly uh, O to, two, to the, uh, two times log N, which is actually pretty good, uh, especially considering usually these will be quite short, but if somebody needs to seek ahead really quickly, uh, they can also do that. Um, we're also probably going to be adding some performance optimization in here as well if this isn't fast enough, uh, where we can keep a bloom filter, you know, again, that is just a cache of these keys actually exist in the MMPT, and that can always be rebuilt, um, which would then give you really, really quick uh, um, cache miss access. Uh, file sharing, so the um, being able to share a reference and a key with somebody who's offline or to update this key if there's been a key rotation, right? So there's three people working on a, on a private file that I own. We want to kick one of them off. And we re-encrypt things. I need to distribute the, the keys again. So we have two folders shared by me and shared with me. Shared by me, uh, we publish people's um, share keys, we call them. So they're uh, RSA keys. Um, and uh, to their account, right? And we're currently distributing them over DNS. Uh, they'll likely end up in the file system when that's, you know, as we're bootstrapping up here. Um, you'll have multiple keys and then we share multiple of these blobs, which have a human readable name, the key, and a symlink into uh, into this structure, into the MMPT. 
which then you can use to decrypt and get the, the subgraph that you, you have access to, or maybe the, the full thing. Uh, and then you also copy it into your shared with me store so that you're not always looking it up, you know, in somebody else's file system and or if that gets deleted or corrupted or whatever, you have a copy. So uh, recap, you know, we have public, private, shared by me and shared with me, um, all underneath an abstraction that really just looks like a Unix file system with some extra niceties around, you can add sort of whatever metadata you want uh, to a node, hard links, soft links, uh, and end-to-end -end secure. And that's all. Yay. Yay. <laughs> Virtual applause. <laughs> awesome. Thanks, Brooke. Um, also, first time presentation for me. <laughs> we, we, we do these things as a forcing function so that we need to write stuff down to share it for other people. Um, questions, comments, thoughts. Yes, Gary, go ahead. Uh, I very much like this idea that uh, the structure and the metadata get sort of uh, obfuscated, okay? And, uh, mm -hmm. and I, I, I've been thinking along the same line from the other end that if, if, you, if you would shard your data in sensible mm -hmm. ways, then in mm -hmm. fact the shredding can be automatic. If you, you, you followed what I'm trying to say, that because that's what you, 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 you the way you did, you shredded the metadata. So it's mm -hmm. really difficult to put together. And I'm just yeah. saying, I'm exploring the possibility of actually, instead of using encryption, use this kind of shredding, which is, mm -hmm. a, which is a natural way of the kind of link IPLD encoding gives you that. So mm -hmm. I, I, I really like that, that idea that it's, it, it, it is quite magic in itself. So I, I, would mm -hmm. I would like to see when somebody else sees the same. So yeah, thank you. That, that, was, that was really good. And, uh, and what, what, uh, just one question, phishing codes, are, are, are there any, are any update on that? Because I, I went uh, all in on this. So I, I'm gonna deploy everything with that and, and do everything with it and uh, perhaps even, even change a bit the, the file system uh, yes. for, for a private use. So, I mean, I, I, yeah. so um, where we are at is there are a number of people um, running up our tailpipe um, wanting lots of things to be shipped yesterday. Um, yeah. so the, um, account system is completely done and live, um, with being able to do web-based creation and login of apps. So just yesterday, I guess we shared oh, Steven's wow. quotes app. Um, we are, um, ha basically there was the final bits of this file system to finish up, um, including a number, like a number of the things that, that Brooke described is stuff that uh, Daniel and Brooke were going back and forth with on Monday of this week, the bloom filter stuff. <laughs> uh, uh, oh yeah, yeah, like the actual implementation, yeah. Yeah, um, so, um, uh, so this is all being bundled up. Um, we have um, made the source code available. So we're working on the SDK out in open. So it has the terrible name of TS-SDK. Um, since we're calling the file system, um, literally web native file system or WinFS, we're thinking of uh, naming the SDK web native as well. Um, so, uh, I'll start a thread on that actually, or, or, or post an issue. So we're just having that discussion. Um, so the web native SDK that is, uh, the, the, the core of this, um, can be used now we're missing, uh, some web to web lim linking and some web to CLI linking. Um, but basically everybody's generating sort of test accounts in the browser right now, uh, to use this. So the quotes app. Um, I've uh, screenshotted it in a couple of different uh, different spots. Um, is uh, is live now, uh, and the off lobby is live, so you can go and try that 
right now and you can go ahead and start consuming um, the, um, uh, the SDK to, to build on top of. Yeah, but what about the fission codes thing? You know, when I could just develop on my machine and uh, fission up. Is that so? So that this is all this is all part of it. Where so yeah, I mean, okay. fission up is working today, um, and it's all based on the accounts. Um, and so the CLI works today. The one thing is, is that we don't have for all of you who are developers, we don't have CLI to web browser linking. So you're gonna be running two separate accounts basically right now. Obviously we need to complete that. And that's because of this model where we can't give the browser access to your local host file system. Um, uh, so that's how extreme the security is basically. Um, but that is basically, that is next on the list. We've, we've heard you web to CLI, like a lot of developers have given us and designers have given us feedback saying, but, but I registered Pat or I registered Brian. And I really like having that, like, that's my username forever on Fission. And I don't want to like have to create another one. We're like, we know <laughs> it's coming, but Fission up works today. That, that's all working, Gary, has, has been working. Well, well, okay, but what I mean is that I, I, I tried to read on whatever I had before and that didn't work. So I probably need to upgrade and things. I'm quite happy with the file system version. You know, I'm not... Uh, yeah, I'm not so, I, I, so, so the, so the main thing, Gary, Gary, is uh, especially you've been trying our stuff for a while. So delete your fission.yaml. Um, if you, including if you already have a key in your, in your if a fission key in dot, in, in dot SSH, um, folder on your local machine, delete it and, and just make sure you have the newest version of the CLI. I just, get the, new, I just, I just get the new Ubuntu and then that, 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 that feels Yeah, good. make yes. make sure you're on the newest version of Fission. Buy a new computer. <laughs> no, 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 virtual, virtual. You know, I mean, you're not, you're not buying new computers. We're, we're reusing that. files, but we're throwing out computers. Yeah, that's, that's our model. Um, that's exactly, vision. yes. Okay, um, thank you, thank you, yeah. Yeah, hit, hit us on support if you have any issues. One of the other services that we're doing is if people want to keep their usernames is we just go and delete them and let them re-register them. So uh, I also I wasn't going to give up my Boris username. Yeah, okay, okay. This may or may not be the right forum and at the risk of sounding naive because I haven't really dunk in as much as I'd like. Um, it feels like the fission file system maps really well to the data model uh, that I have in the client app uh, that I'm going to try and get onto fission. Um, can you show, or Daniel or uh, Brooklyn, can you guys show what some client code might look like with respect to like, um, you know, cause like in Elm, I make a type and it's got some fields and some mm -hmm. like strings or some just primitive data stored in that. Like, I'm not really thinking in terms of like, oh, I'm gonna make that type a file or does that make sense? Am I? Yeah. The, the short version, and I'll let Daniel show this uh, directly, is uh, if you can serialize it to JSON, you can stick it in or whatever format you want, and you can stick it in the file system. Uh, so you could, with Elm in particular, it's really nice because you can take the entire state, dump that to a JSON file. This is what I was hoping for, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> so you literally just like work with the model cached in Fission yes. file system. Okay. Correct. So you're, you're, yeah. you have two ports that model in, model out, and is, yep. is that real? Like, So I, <laughs> I would assume that that's how we've, what we've had to build. We, we, we definitely want to build some uh, nice Elm bindings for this. It just hasn't been the, the top thing. Um, oh, yeah, but uh, Daniel, if you want to, if you have a, a section that would make sense to show. Yeah, sure. Um... Yeah, I'll, I'll actually just show the section that I had at the end of the... Daniel's showing Elm rather than Steven? I feel like Steven's like fist pumping in the background. Don't get too excited, <laughs> boys. These are the JavaScript ports into Elm. So it's <laughs> oh, oh it's, it's, <laughs> got it, got it. Uh, yeah, right. So the, these are, and I'm, I'm very much an Elm novice. So uh, yeah, so bear with can, me on that. Can you these up are, the uh, font size? Oh, yeah, sure. Is that better? It's readable on my machine. I can see it. Okay. Works on yeah. my machine. Also, just real quick, <laughs> I was curious what the UUID or like where that constant is coming from. 
Right. So uh, right now, that's something that uh, that we have hard coded. Um, okay. So it's uh, it's up to you to select a unique identifier. Um, but that will be coming from the SDK soon. And that's kind of what I was talking about. That right now, this is a, a very thin layer over the file system. It's just a way of helping you uh, format paths um, in in an apps folder. Um, but uh, something that we're going to be working on is a better abstraction over the file system for interacting with um, with apps um, cool. so that you won't call directly into the file system, you'll call into this app interface. Um, and again, if you want to, you can always drop down into the nitty gritty of the file system. Um, it just depends on what you want for your interface. Um, yeah, so as you, as you can see here, this is whenever you add a quote to the file system, it's literally just, um, you give it an ID, you store it at the path of that ID, and you just JSON stringify that quote. So each quote is just a um, very simple JSON object. Um, and then in terms of loading them, uh, you just do, you know that all of your quotes are in this collections folder. Uh, you do an LS of that path, and then for each one, you, um, you cat that object. Uh, so if, I'm, if you wanted to, you could simplify it even more and just have everything in a simple JSON store. Uh, this is a bit more flexible because it has everything broken out as its own object. And it also makes it a bit more reusable if another app wants to tap into the quotes that you have in your file system. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah, you, you mentioned two things that were in my, just floating around in my head. One that like, yeah. because you've broken them out by object, they're like not as, uh, what's the word? Uh, like condensed, right? It could be, mm -hmm. you know, you could just be JSON serializing the entire model. Right. Um, mm -hmm. Can you elaborate on the reusability piece? Like if another app wanted to tap into your, is that what you're saying? So, so there's, there's, there's um, programming level things and then there's conceptual level things. I'll handle a quick conceptual one. Yeah, so that's kind of what I'm struggling to. Yeah. So, so essentially the quotes app is a quotes editor. So you can go it and anyone can go to it and log in with their own uh, Fission account. And those quotes, um, they can view and they're saved to their file system. Um, and they could be saved publicly or privately, but we'll skip that for a second. Um, now there's another mode where you've got on the file system, you've got a folder filled with um, quotes.json. Uh, Imagine your blog wanting to embed a quotes widget, which you could drive from that collection of quotes.json, given that your blog has, would have permission to read it or that quotes app has published it um, publicly um, so that anyone could read uh, you know, you, you saw in several places, boris.fission.name. Um, there's actually an SSL certificate error for me on that right now. But uh, so that's, that's a, uh, a file system, uh, basically, and where we, we, where we push some things publicly, uh, where we store in DNS. Uh, and so, and that's the public root of my tree. So I might have a folder in there called quotes. So you could, you could literally suck in Boris's quotes remotely. Again, think of it as like embedding tweets or other systems like this where you're using the file system as a, uh, as a source. So that's the conceptual version. Yeah. Daniel, is there anything more that you want to say on the, on the technical layer? Um, <clears throat> yeah, no, no, that's, that's about right. Um, the reason that you might want to have uh, them split up is that, uh, you know, another application uh, that's calling into it, like Boris is describing, you might want to reference just a single tweet or a smaller subset of those tweets. Uh, and I mean, there's ways around that if you wanted to serialize everything into a single JSON object. But uh, let's say that on your, uh, this example is a little bit contrived, but uh, let's just say on like your personal website, you want to have your favorite quote of the moment or something. It might be a pointer to just a single quote in your uh, quotes collections folder. Um, and now let's say that you notice a typo in that quote, you change it in the quotes app. And because both of those applications are pointing to the same data source, then that change of the typo or whatever will propagate to both of those, um, to both of those sites. Uh, and that's, that's a, it's a little bit contrived with the quotes, um, but you can imagine, uh, you, you can extrapolate that out to other types of data. Um, yeah. Where, no, that where makes one change sense. gets reflected in multiple locations. Like an edge case yeah. I'm thinking of is like, if I'm subscribed to like the Windows scroll event 
And if I'm serializing mm -hmm. and deserializing my entire model, like one is like, is that even going to, perf like, can it even do that? Like, can it go fast mm -hmm. enough to like handle enough of those events, that kind of thing. But also like, if it can't, then like, this is sort of the best practice as it were. Yeah. Uh, so in terms of things like window scroll position, uh, really we're because extending the file system metaphor right we're talking about memory versus disk right um can it go that fast i mean honestly probably because we're we have a, um, a virtualization in between right where we're updating a local model and then dumping into ipfs um so could it yeah i, I haven't tried it seems reasonable, um, but it's more likely that you would use it and say, okay, now I want a snapshot state, right? Kind of how you would do it with, with actual disk. Um, it's also so interesting like that you're saying about- Once every 10, 15 seconds or something, you just have a subscription sure. that like snapshots the model for a user. Yeah, or like, I haven't seen any changes in, in 1500 yeah, milliseconds. Or, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, exactly. Or like uh, only do this on um, these events, but not scroll position, right? And just save scroll position if it's, you know, debounce just that one, right? So like you have lots of options, especially in Elm where it's so clean. Um, it, it is interesting to think about the, the full application state, including things like scroll position, fields, all of that. Um, the main case that we've been thinking about for uh, shared data is things like photos, right? Uh, so you have photos on whatever, Facebook and Instagram. Um, Why do you have to upload the photos twice, right? Why can't you just yeah. share them? Why are you editing here? And then you've got to like re-upload it all the time, right? We're saying no, like you're logged in, you have your photos. Um, however, I think that there is a incentivization pressure for people to say, well, I don't care about the other person's photo app this is mine, I'm going to stick it in my own format. Hence the application um, abstractions where it'll feel the same or easier to the user or to the developer and we'll incentivize them with ease of use to put things in, in some sort of more shared model. Awesome, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, and the mental model again is more like mobile um, where uh, you, your app is asking for permission to files that you, that you already have. Uh, I'm going to just actually, um, hit the stop recording button. So, uh, we don't have anything scheduled for next week. I have, uh, um, various people that I'm reaching out to. So Peter Alvaro, um, uh, I know that Gary has been interested in, I've reached out to him and some folks that fly. Um, if anyone has suggestions of people that, or, or topics they'd like to do, uh, that's great. And maybe we'll even do something like um, uh, walk through some sample apps or, or other things like that. We'll lots more fission focused stuff as we release things, but uh, always, always interested in, in hearing excellent talks. So uh, thank you very much for the recording. Thank you, Brooke. That was great.